so wonderful to be here with you all today. Happy Saturday, and thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited um, to introduce some incredible women to talk to you about their career journeys and what it means to be really rising up and reaching back to support other women along the journey. Um, and Jolie, come on up. Yes, yes. Grab, grab that chair on the end. Perfect. So I'm going to go ahead and briefly introduce each of our panelists, and then I'll let them tell you a little bit about themselves in their own words. Um, so first, we have Ali Guaneros Luna, who is an electrostatic discharge program manager at the NASA Ames Research Center. Literally builds satellites for NASA, no big deal. <laughs> um, we also have uh, Cordelia McGee-Tubb, who is the lead accessibility engineer at Salesforce. Welcome, Cordelia. We have Sheree Gibbs, who is founder and CEO of She Designs and founder and executive director of the Women of Color UX Design course. Welcome, Sheree. And we have Jolie Martin, who is the quantitative user experience researcher at Pinterest. Please join me in welcoming these amazing women. So if you could start off um, and just share your name again and in your own words a little bit about what you do. And we'll start here with Ali. Sure. Uh, my name is Ali Guarneros Luna. I'm an aerospace and systems engineer. My official title on NASA is uh, ESD program manager, but I do a lot of things. I build satellites, I mentor, I am a researcher, I'm a PI, so I do a lot of things. Yeah. Well, um, hi, I'm Cordelia McGee Tubb. I'm a lead accessibility engineer at Salesforce. So basically what I do is I work with everyone in our technology and products organization um, to help them make more accessible products. And my main focus right now is a suite of products called Service Cloud. Hello everyone, my name is Sheree Gibbs and I'm the founder and director of the Women of Color UX Design course and also She Designs Creative Agency. And our mission is to really empower women of color to accelerate in technology. And so we equip them with professional development and training so that they can get there. Hi, everybody. I'm Jolie Martin. I'm a quantitative user experience researcher at Pinterest. And what that means is that I am sort of like a data, data scientist. I do a lot of behavioral analyses of our users and also try to really um, optimize for actual user experience. So collect a lot of ground truth about user attitudes and um, intent and what value they get from the service. And I actually started out in that role here at Google um, over five years ago on the search analysis team. So. Great to have you back. Well, welcome everyone. So we'd love to start with hearing a little bit about your passions and motivations for what you're really trying to solve for in these really incredible, unique roles that you have. I can take it. So um, I really had an, enjoyed uh, hearing uh, the last keynote speaker and thinking about that friction of feeling like you're not uh, welcome into a space or not feeling comfortable. So part of what led me to start this mission-oriented company was the fact that I felt really um, isolated and disconnected from the company I was working for. And when I would go to work every day, I was the only woman of color in a tech space and I was basically around a bunch of men all day and I was like, where are the women at? And so that was, that's, what, that's what led me to really realize that there is a lack of diversity and I didn't also feel included. And so how could I um, create community with women? And that's what really led me to this passion that I have right now for my company, so. Amazing. Um, so I mentioned I work in accessibility, and I kind of uh, came into this passion organically. When I first graduated from college as a computer science major, I didn't actually know what accessibility was. Mm -hmm. um, and I started volunteering as a, um, a computer tutor for senior citizens in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I got really frustrated because it dawned on me that, like, Maybe this is a realization everyone else already had had, but I hadn't had it yet that like most technology is built by young able-bodied people and therefore accidentally for young able-bodied people. And it was really, really frustrating for me to see people struggling to use uh, things like Facebook, uh, certain email providers I won't mention, and like, like other tools that should be um, easy and intuitive for all, but that were a real struggle for people who were, you know, um, losing their vision as they aged, losing their dexterity. Um, so I developed this, this frustration, but also this passion for making technology um, better for people with a wide range of abilities. Um, so that kind of led me into 
to uh, this passion for accessibility for all. Um, and yeah. Awesome. Anyone else? Well, my passion basically is about building, inspiring, well, actually building, um, be a mentor for younger, you know, generations that are coming and trying to inspire them to get into STEM. Um, growing up, and I probably will talk about my history a little bit. Um, my family was not a uh, per se tech person, but um, I feel the need that a lot of uh, diversity is missing, especially in the workforce that I work, which is you know the aerospace industry. And so for me, it's about reaching out to those young, you know, coming out of high school, college, and tell them that it's possible to reach your dreams and, you know, be a, a role model for them, right? And so every time I, anywhere I go, I try to be that person that they can look at myself, uh, at me and look at themselves and say, well, if she did it, I can do it, right? Yes. Be able to provide that perspective that a lot of times we're missing in these fields, right, of technology and, you know, reaching that gap and make, you know, doors open for them. So my passion is definitely in, in that, even, you know, besides the technology. <laughs> yeah, that if you can see it, you can be it. We really need those role models. Amazing. Julie, how about you? Sure. Um, so one thing that I didn't mention about myself is that I'm a new mom. And so mm. that's really shaping my view of Congratulations. Um, you know, working on technology. And so my son is three months old and I've been on um, maternity leave for the last four months. And so it's really um, brought a new perspective to some of the challenges or um, you know, opportunities that we have as, as women in the workplace and how we need to support one another. So, I mean, just seeing my son as a complete blank slate, it's like, I have no idea what he, um, what challenges he might face, what his interests will be, but I really wish technology was to a point where it could kind of improve lives for everybody. And that hopefully he grows up in a world where, you know, half, is, <laughs> half the people he sees building technology are women and it's built for women and everybody. So. Awesome. So we talk a lot at Google about inclusive design and inclusive products and trying to improve um, accessibility. Um, Cordelia, I would love to hear about how you particularly work to, to build products that work for everyone in the work you do. Yeah, so it's, it's really exciting that I work in accessibility because like it, I, I, I see it as a way to kind of tangibly put, tangibly put equality into a product. Because mm. um, when you think about um, people people have a huge range of abilities. And if we're only designing uh, products and particularly pr productivity tools um, that only work for people with a certain set of abilities, then we're making it really, really challenging for other people to succeed in the world. Um, so the way that I approach accessibility is really about yeah, like this idea of building a quality in. Um, and the ways that we do this at Salesforce is we have, we have a dedicated accessibility team and we work across the company to really empower other people within the company to build accessibility into their products, whether that be around um, uh, keyboard navigation or mouse navigation. So can someone actually navigate through this UI using a variety of tools? Um, can they, uh, is the color contrast high enough? There's a huge range of things, but um, it's a really collaborative effort because it is all about um, embracing diversity um, in our user base and building products for all. Awesome. And Jolie, I think you've done some research in this too. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, what I really love as somebody who works with data is that I can take it upon myself or feel that it's somewhat my obligation to speak for the people whose voices might kind of slip through the cracks mm -hmm. when you look at like a graph of aggregate metrics over time. Really, that's like the core um, user or the average user who's being represented there and moving the needle on things that a lot of leadership cares about. And so I really feel like part of what I do is to make sure that I get full representation or understanding of some users who may not be that well represented in the data. Data. Sometimes that might just be that, you know, they're um, in a place where the internet is slow or they don't have a lot of access, so they aren't really using um, the services or platforms as much as other people. Um, so I try to at least bring out those voices and highlight cases where we might be um, building for some average user or the most common user and not for people on the periphery. Um, so at least raising that. And then I think when it comes to actually building products that are really inclusive, it means dedicating resources and time, you know, it's 
management can't just give lip service to doing that. You really need to put the people and the money behind it. Um, and so an example of that at Pinterest is that we recently released skin tone filters, which um, allow people to kind of search for other people who look like them when they do beauty searches and find products that are um, more relevant to them. And that was a dedicated team for, you know, many months. So um, I think that's a great example of um, how you really need to do these things the right way. Yeah, and I just wanted to add something on the whole inclusion piece because part of what my work is involved in is incorporating the right people in that conversation. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when we want to create products, it's hard when you don't have a lens from that culture and you're not very familiar with the culture that you're designing things for. So a lot of the things that we talk to our students about is ensuring that they have their hat, you know, their diversity hat and that they're being a champion. And so what that really means is if you look at the lens or, you know, what's happening in the world right now, there's a lot lot of, I would say, uh, racial like undertones and unconscious biases that are happening across multiple different, um, you know, te uh, I would say like different, um, you know, uh, industries. And so what's really important is that we ensure that we equip everyone to um, be knowledgeable and also just be in that in that space. Right. So one of the projects that we had our students work on um, when we, they first started was around how they would be able to create um, a an empowering, um, I would think it was like a hair company for people with disabilities. And I talked to Cordelia about this as well. And sometimes it's hard to just, um, it's, it's really hard for us to know that we're creating inclusive products when we don't have inclusion represented in that mm -hmm. team, so. Yeah, that reminds me of that saying, the nothing about us without us. You really need people at the table. Um, it's not about um, imagining or wondering and figuring it out for others. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, so what do you all think is the biggest opportunity or one of the biggest opportunities, because there are so many, for women to really be contributing to and altering the course of what the future of technology um, brings? Well, from my perspective, I think, uh, or perspective, you know, so women, you know, we bring value added to the table. Uh, a lot of times when I see it in meetings with men, you know, talk about going to space, you know, we focus about the astronauts they are going, but we're missing, you know, the women factor, right? So not, um, not until recently they start, you know, bringing it up, but I think us as a women, you know, we bring value added to that, to the table and we need to embrace it and we need to talk about it and bring it to life. You know, if we don't do that, then, you know, we always will be in the shadows. So I think that is something that we can contribute to our societies, right? And especially now, like being a mother, you know, that's something that young, maybe generations um, that are working right now, they they don't see it, you know, that become, you know, being a mother working, you know, full-time raising your kids is important. I myself, I have four children. And so, you know, it was, it was hard at the beginning, but, you know, I, I make sure that everybody knew that I was a mother, I had all these issues, but I was here to contribute and do the work. And I was no less than a male engineer who was young and, you know, and single. So definitely that's something that we, you know, we can bring into uh, the table. So. Could you I mean, just restate the question? Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna add that I think like that's a tension that a lot of us face with that issue or other gender in the workplace issues. Like, should we just pretend that they don't exist and is that better? Um, mm -hmm. I think it's personally like much more helpful to have events like this and forums for discussion like on a regular basis. It doesn't need to be a one time a year thing, but you know, like a Slack channel where you can, like we have a mom Slack channel at Pinterest where we can talk about all of the issues related to work-life balance and, um, and just to have a forum for that, I think is really important. And I, I think just kind of going to the title of this panel of Rise Up, Reach Back, like one thing that we can all do as we progress through our careers is, is really look for opportunities to raise up other women. Like I kind of only in the past year or two have kind of felt like I've gotten into this place where I can like where I see myself more as a mentor for, for younger people in the field. And I think like actually we should all consider ourselves mentors at every time because just even like when you're brand new into a field, just like supporting each other, you can do that with any level of experience. Um, but like, I've finally gotten to this point where I was like, yeah, I can really like uh, use whatever clout I have to like 
um, help make sure that this other per this other woman gets like some really cool projects at work. Um, that like if someone's talking over her in a meeting, that I'm gonna go back and say, hey, what were you going to say? And like little mm -hmm. things like that um, are things that anyone can do as an ally. But I think that um, women having faced a lot of these sort of uh, what is the word that I'm looking for? Um, these little microaggressions. Microaggressions, yeah. yes. Um, having faced these microaggressions every day, just identifying when those happen to other people and finding ways to kind of help um, uh, reach out a hand and pull them out of that. I love that, yeah, and it really speaks to this broader community of what is it to come together as women in tech. We have 20,000 women across 20 sites coming together for, for these sorts of events this month that we're excited about. What are the other ways that some of you have done exactly that, of trying to kind of lift up and raise up other women, and how can we continue to do that in our industries? Gosh, well, for me, definitely I look out for my friends at work, you know, my you know, older and younger women, and not just, you know, women in general, but I try to look out for, you know, men, you know, or different backgrounds. Uh, one of the things that I am proud to say is that when I, every summer we get interns at NASA, and my team is the most diverse. You know, last year I had 50 and 50, you know, 50 women, 50% 50 of women, 50% of men, and they all came from different backgrounds, and I purposely did that Pick the students because I wanted to show that having a diverse, you know, workforce, you know, you become more enriched, you know, you, you can actually contribute more because every single one of them brought their own uh, experience and they were able to solve problems that perhaps myself, I will not be able to see with those eyes, right? And so it's so important for me to bring that diversity and also ensure that my Friends that you know work with me hand in hand, whether in the same projects or other projects, you know, I'm able to help them in any way, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I constantly try to look out for them because if they feel happy, you know, and their happiness will bring happiness to me, right? And so I, I definitely try to be, you know, that person in my, you know, my area. And I definitely th think that. One of the, the, the things I share with all my interests is that you should, you know, you want to see the world change, you should be the change first, mm. right? Mm -hmm. We need to start taking that uh, role, right? So we want to see the world change. We need to start with our own selves. How can we change our workforce? How can we, you know, somehow um, infuse ourselves into the society and make that change? And by being that, you know, I'm making the role model and ensuring that when they leave my side, those students that are coming from all these different places, they will take that work and they will try to do it, you know, in their areas, wherever they are, no matter what their background is. Because I'm, you know, in this position, you know, working for NASA <laughs> and telling them that, yes, they need to be the change and it needs to be started with them. Yeah. Cool. And how about... Um roles that sponsors may have played in your in your own career. So I sometimes talk about mentorship and sponsorship as mentorship are people that are talking to you. Sponsorship, um, people are talking about you in rooms that you may not be in, but they're really advocating for you, opening doors for your success. Are there any sponsorship relationships that have supported you in your careers? And if so, how did you cultivate that relationship with those folks? Yeah, I can definitely talk about a really um, integral mentor in my life. Um, her name is uh, Tashara Gibbs, and we have the same last name, but we're not related. <laughs> uh, we actually met each other at IBM seven years ago. And one of the first interactions that we had was that she was giving me feedback on a presentation I was making. And her feedback was so detailed, and I could tell that she was being authentic about it. And from there, I had a lot of respect from her because she's a thought leader. She's definitely an encourager and a UX strategist. Um, and then, you know, seven years later, we're working together. She's actually an instructor on my team now, and she's one of our founding members. And I talk to her almost like every day, whether I'm coming up with new ideas for the program or I'm talking about new business. And so one of the ways that I cultivated that relationship was really, you know, I would just say 
being earnestly thankful <laughs> and also making sure that it was about building a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think of mentorship as this transaction, right? Like you do something for me, I do something for you. But that's not really how any of the relationships that we have work. Mm -hmm. It's about, I want to see you at your best, right? I care about your career development. I care about what projects you get placed on. And I can think of a few other mentors that I had at IBM that allowed me to make sure that I was on the right projects, right? Getting you exposure to be in that space, right? Right? And so those opportunities um, ended up being in my portfolio. That portfolio led me to better um, positions later on. So I definitely would say making sure that you have uh, identified your mentor and then not say like, hey, can you be my mentor? Like it's the person in your life that mm -hmm. is investing their time in you and you can continue to follow up with them in an earnest and very thankful way. Mm -hmm. I love that. Very authentic. You know, this is about connection, right? We're humans. Cool. Cordelia. Um, so one of my greatest sponsors um, is a product manager at Salesforce named Shannon Hale. Uh, so when I first started my career in tech, I was a full stack developer at Salesforce and I was unhappy, but I wasn't sure what I was unhappy about. I was just like, I don't know, like databases aren't really my thing, but I guess this is what it means to be a software developer. And, um, and Shannon uh, was a a uh, kind of newly minted PM for a product manager for our team who had previously be, been a UX designer at Salesforce and before that had had this like long and very interesting career in tech that included also being a software developer. And she kind of identified in me my like passion for usability before I think I ever really realized it. Um, and she saw that I was really passionate, not necessarily like the coding was cool, but I, but the code was a means to an end of, of creating a really good user experience. So, so she kind of identified that and then like was like, hey, Cordelia, have you ever thought about uh, like maybe being part of uh, the user experience team, let me see if I can pull some strings and get you a t sample project there. Um, so she pulled some strings and got me this like uh, short little uh, prototyping project to just kind of test the waters of working directly with the designer, um, being part of the whole design process. And it was just like a light bulb click for me of like, this is what I want to be doing. I want to be writing code because I like writing code, but I want to be doing it like in this very uh, designy environment. And I'm really grateful for her like kind of seeing that in me and being like, hey, try this whole other department because that actually, she also is very passionate about accessibility. So um, taught me a lot of it, like as I would, or kind of introduced me to that space, um, which is now my main passion. And she also just um, was a really good uh, example of like being able to blend both um, one's technical passions and one's artistic passions. I think a lot of times there's this misconception that you have to be like one type of person, but mm. you can be a really varied multifaceted person. And so in addition to kind of setting me off on my new career path, she also was like, hey, by the way, there's this like part-time master's degree in comics that you might be interested in. And then I went out and got that. And that's like totally disconnected in certain ways from accessibility, but it really just showed that she was uh, looking out for um, my growth in all these different ways. And I also wanted to call out, she's in the audience, another Aww. great sponsor is, or, yeah. Um, Oh, Shannon, Shannon's not in the audience, but I wanted to call out Gina Ann over here um, because another thing that has been really impactful for my career and for a lot of the opportunities that I've been given was um, other women in tech who run tech conferences like this um, reaching out and asking me to come speak because it opened up um, a lot of uh, uh, doors to just networking, um, to like becoming more confident in myself by speaking. So Gina here invited me to come speak at the, Clar the first ever Clarity Conference. And it was my first time like up on a big stage and I was really nervous, but it was, it was a really exciting moment um, that really kind of launched um, this thought that like I can be passionate about something and I can also spread that passion to other people. So thank you, Gina. Yes, love that. Um, I have one more question, but we're going to also invite folks to ask, ask questions. So if you want to line up, if you is there anything you want to ask any of the panelists, go for it. 
Um, so life definitely has both its ups and downs and moments that we need to be celebrating and also some moments that are really challenging and we need to work through. So if any of you are willing to share, can you share one of the more challenging times of either your life or career and what you've learned about resilience through that? Ali, we were talking backstage and I know you have quite a story. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I mentioned that I, you know, I'm a mother of four children. Um, Two of them are sing, uh, special needs. Uh, they have a mental disability. And I did not, when school graduated, went to work and they had kids. No, I did it all backwards. <laughs> I ended up having kids and then decided to go back to school. <laughs> so uh, when I graduated, then I you know, ended up working for NASA. But, you know, being as a parent, you know, and uh, having special, ch special needs children, uh, for those of, you know, that, that find themselves in that situation, you as a parent, you never actually, you know, become, uh, you actually leave that role, you know, even now that my children are older, you know, I still be, continue to be um, a parent for them, even though they're older, you know, over, over 18. But I can tell you one time that um, I was actually in charge of these, uh, we had CO2 tanks uh, going into the space station, uh, cryogenic, you know, CO2 tanks, and I found that they were leaking. And we had, um, we had suspicion that we probably had some also in space station that they were leaking. So, you know, the engineers, you know, I was not the lead engineer, but I was the authority over this project. And I, you know, I had asked them to inform the space station so they can address this issue. And um, obviously, you know, my kid, um, when this happened and, you know, we were going through all that process of, you know, trying to find the root cause, and try to address it and inform the space station, uh, my, both of my children became ill. Uh, one of my son had to be hospitalized and also my daughter in two different places. You know, one was in Palo Alto, the other one was in Freeman, and then I had to address this issue with the space station. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really a tough moment in my life because literally I couldn't, you know, actually sleep. You know, like I would take probably naps of 50 minutes and I wake up thinking about the different issues that, you know, we encounter in our work and thinking about my children, you know, and how they're going to overcome these issues, right? Uh, luckily, you know, we were able to address the problem at the space station, resolve it, you know, and come with a solution. And, you know, and my kids, you know, um, after, you know, going through that whole process, you know, they overcome their difficulties. But, you know, it, it definitely shows the resilience that I had at that moment, right? Because I was very systematic of how to address everything that I encountered at that moment and how, you know, I was going to resolve it you know, professionally and also some mother, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I'm also single parent, so it was even harder, right? Because you had to take care of the bills, you know, making sure that the other two children, you know, are you know, surviving, right? Uh, they have, they're able to, you know, they're okay because, you know, as a traumatic as it is, you know, having two children, you know, the hospital, you have the other two, that you need to ensure that they, you know, they're okay. And, you know, I, I definitely learned a lot from that experience. And, you know, thinking about it, I was like, gosh, you know, <laughs> hopefully I don't have any more of those. <laughs> but, um, but it's definitely something that we learn, you know, if, if, you, if you, as I, especially because I'm an engineer, I always think about, you know, process, right? How, what happened? How do we, you know, become better? So I have learned from that experience and I'm sure that I have measures in place now that if anything happens, I know how I can address those issues and make sure that everything, you know, is taken care of. So, you know, it's, it's definitely difficult, you know, it's a, it's a parent, it's a woman, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, we, we have, we can overcome those issues, you know, and, um, you know, I'm glad I was able to do that. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing so vulnerably your story. Yeah. It's powerful and we see you. Um, I see we have a line, so if we don't mind popping to questions and we can go from there, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being an awesome panel. And Ali, I work in the aerospace industry, so I resonate very closely with you. I have been 
a person who has experienced unconscious bias in my career, such as when people say something like referring to my team as gentlemen, when myself and other women are on it, people in a room saying stuff like, good job, you guys. Like, I know it's, I know it seems not a big deal, but to me it is. I have launched a journey of being a promoter of women in STEM. I'm a social media influencer on Instagram, Space Woman TV. Please follow my, my dream of really promoting women in STEM. And how, how do I make the argument? How do I come across and say, I want to be included in this team or in this conversation? And when you use terms like gentlemen or guys or call me a kid because I'm younger than you. How, how do I argue and, and challenge and just make a more inclusive language culture in my workplace? Oh, gosh. Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I totally hear you. I, I myself, you know, had the same experience, especially, you know, working in the Air Force. I mean, the aerospace industry where most of the you know, people working are male, white male, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, gosh, I, you know, maybe because I'm rebellious, you know, when that happens, I'm always like, what about me? You know, like, are you including yeah. me, right? Yeah. You know, I'm here, you know, forget about me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So, so we, we do have to, you know, like, make a statement, you know, right away, you know, so they know and they can correct themselves, right? And maybe even privately, you know, talk to them and say, you know, hey, you know, you had a woman in your audience and you didn't recognize it. Mm -hmm. Can you please do it next time, right? Mm -hmm. And ensure that you are having that conversation with them and you include them in that conversation. Because we cannot change something as of this nature if we constantly attacking, right? right, you know, telling them like they're not doing it right, but also bringing them in to be part of it mm -hmm. and be able to be a promoter of your cost, right? So you, I mean, we have to really reach out and bring them with us to this fight, right? To be able to say, yes, you have to recognize women. There's women in this area and you, talk, you need to address it and talk about it. The other one is that I, very proud to bring diversity in my work, like I said before. I consciously bring different people. I, you know, like I can tell you, I, I had the first African-American last summer and I was so proud because I, I was never able to get one. <laughs> and, you know, and being him there, it was, you know, it, it, I'm, I'm proud, right? Because I'm bringing diversity. You, you have somebody else who you don't see in, in the workplace, right? I also had the first um, American Indian, you know, woman, you know, in, in the summer. So, so for me, it's so important. There are small milestones, but it means a lot because then you can start demonstrating that there is a change and you can make that change if you purposely do it. Right. And so, yes, I, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. And we should definitely also fight to bring those other folks into our, you know, conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. We'll just do one at a time for, yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so part of my team is uh, mixed, which is good. But what happens is anybody has a situation, I'm the first to react to help them. So now I have this tag in office like, oh, the rebel is coming. <laughs> but that said, I want the management to hear me rather than having that, oh, yeah, I understand the conversation and that's it. Is there anything that you guys have done to be heard that examples will help me instead of just going into the room and, oh, this is a situation and they're like, oh, yeah, we hear you. Good. All good. But nothing happens after that. So I want to know like how we can be heard and how it can be implemented. So I'm just going to keep asking you questions until I get enough information. <laughs> I'm sorry. So what are the methods that you're taking right now to start the conversation? Um, I'm guessing you want some type of policy change within your work environment. Are you going into the office? Are you sending emails? Are you sending follow-up emails? So I'll give you an example. Uh, always there are these 
earlier views of how work is done by one person, how it is not done by other person. And within the team, uh, right now we don't have the 360. It's just top down. And my colleagues are the same sector who are in the same line as me were upset. So I spoke with them and also got them in the room with the management and we kind of spoke this is a situation because they were not ready to open up different situations there felt like uh should i even talk about it am i even worth enough to talk to the management maybe that is true they're thinking low of me maybe i am low so that was the situation so i brought them into room and talked with management to understand like why they were friends end of the conversation we understood they just gave that rating to them because that person never talks back so that type of conversation one thing of course emails and also trying to bring the hr to understand how these policies work but as i said they said they say like yes good job thank you to bringing to our notice but it's been like one two years there's no change it's still the same thing so I want to understand, is there anything that I can do additionally to be heard? And I'm also making it a point to bring other women to talk rather than me being the only source in my team to talk. Because end of the day, I also don't want to be in a position like people are shutting me off because they think like I'm talking too much or complaining too much or telling too many things. So... Definitely. And I was just thinking of so many different things while you were speaking. The first is that one of my students is going through something so similar where she works in an office that doesn't, um, to her, she's having a lot of problems speaking up, but also getting recognition for projects. And I also just spoke at um, Square. So they have an ESG. Um, it's like their Black Student Association. And so one of the things that I can um, share with you is that maybe you want to create some type of coalition or you know monthly kind of group where it's the people that have these concerns, but they also want to do other like inspiring things during like as a community. And so to me, I remember working at a company where, like I said, I was the only person of color, and it was really hard to have a point of view, but also to have power in what you're saying when you're the only one. So I really acknowledge that you are reaching out to other women and trying to get them to come into the conversation with you. But one of the ways that you can build more power is to ensure that you have a group to kind of lean on. So whenever you talk with the HR representative, you're saying this association and I, you know, and you can also CC people. There's a really, there's a power in CC guys. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, um, there is. something to talk about is that the power that you have being a voice, but being voices. Um, so again, kudos to you for speaking up and, and feeling very um, fierce and, you know, what it is that you have to say and what you'd like to change, but also make sure that you're building community so that it's, it's just heard a little bit differently. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, we'll go upstairs for a question here. Um, hi. Yeah, so I had a question. I have a peer at work who's also a woman, and there's so few women in, a, in our startup. And then, um, like, for example, um, if I ask for help, sometimes she doesn't help me, but I always try to help her. So, But I want to keep, like, a good work environment, but I want to be like, you didn't help me this time, you know, so I'm not going to help you until you help me, you know. But, you know, she's another woman, right? And sometimes this happens, but I'm not really sure how to navigate it while keeping a good work environment. Anyone who hasn't answered a question in a bit want to share? I mean, I just keep going back to like the imposter syndrome. And I think sometimes it can actually lead women in the workplace to feel more competitive with one another if mm -hmm. they feel like there's a limited number of spots for women. I mean, it might just be that's her personality. And she's like that with, <laughs> with men as well. And then that's something else to work on. But there is this unique dynamic where sometimes um, it's questioned whether somebody is behaving a certain way because of some gender dynamic. Um, I mean, I would say like flattery is always great. Like if there are aspects of her help that are really useful to you to make sure to point that out and um, show gratitude for them. And you know, if that's, if that's the end of it, then you still have an amicable relationship. Um, but I think this also goes to the idea that like, you know, with mentorship, it's not always one woman who's got it made and another who's struggling to aspire to be exactly that woman. You each have things that you can um, 
share with one another and your strengths. And no one is aspiring to be exactly the other person or to have your careers be completely um, conjoined so that her welfare is totally tied in with yours either. Um, Thank you. Great. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, Sheree. I just want to say it's really refreshing to see um, a woman, like a product designer, especially a black woman, um, because I'm the only woman of color in the like numerous roles that I've been in. And most of the people I report to are white males. And so I kind of, I really resonate with your story. And so my question to you is how do you deal with women who are at like a senior management level who don't identify as maybe women or identify as women of color, right? Or as minorities and who don't see the bias that they experience. I've talked a little bit about this with my friend and she said to me that she had that experience where she didn't see the unconscious bias that was going on until she experienced it, which I think is not exactly what I want to happen to these women in management. So I just wanted to know, how do you deal with women who don't see that there is a problem? Oh, so first, thank you so much. That made my day. <laughs> Uh, also, I have definitely experienced this, um, and it is really frustrating, and especially when someone doesn't identify with themselves and understanding that they are the minority, right? And you, and being someone in tech, you are definitely going to be around these male-dominated spaces, so there's a level of un like uncomfortability that you have to kind of take on with you. And instead of trying to say, you are part of this group and trying to attack her, I would just maybe share some stories and send her articles. I don't know what your relationship is like with her, but one, she has to be able to identify the problem. And maybe there are compelling stories that you have or instances that you could bring up. But sometimes it's about, you don't really have to persuade anyone to be an ally. Mm -hmm. You just need to find your allies, right? And so it's okay if you can't convert everyone. That's something that as women, you grow up and you realize, I'm not gonna be able to convert everyone. Everyone is not going to be on my team and that's totally okay. Respect their opinion, but I wouldn't say incorporate, <laughs> don't, don't try to force it. Um, and if that relationship doesn't genuinely develop, then I would say make sure that you have your point of view, that she recognizes your point of view, and that you are able to find allies that really promote and uplift you. Thank you so much. And I want to take that moment, too, to, to call in the fellow white women in this room for us to be learning more about race and our own blind spots around that and how we can really be making sure that our women of color in this industry who are even less uh, represented and included in many ways are truly coming along on that, on that journey. Um, Bell Hooks and Robin D'Angelo are two um, authors who have written some incredible books that have helped me personally with that. Okay, I'll take another question here. Hi there. First of all, I want to thank everybody that put all this effort in for this event because um, honestly, this is the type of events I can be who I want to be and who I am. Um, being an Afghan American and the first generation here, and then adding to that, being in the engineering world, which is pretty much male dominated, it's always been an uphill battle. Mm. Um, whether it's been school, whether it's been work, um, I've been 10 plus years in the network engineering field and not once have I been in a team with more than one woman than myself. Um, it's been a very big struggle, struggle to the point where whether you're in meetings, you're either assumed the assistant that's there to take notes or you're a mister until they find out that you're not, um, things like that. And it's always an uphill battle and you're always trying to convince them that, yeah, you know what? I know you're a guy and I, I, and I know you're the typical engineer, but you know what? Let's do this. Mm. And I can tell you I'm better, you know, things like that. <laughs> and and you, you get to this point where you always have these walls that are built and you're just waiting for the next struggle. Mm. Um, my question is, um, there's a lot of groups like this and there's a lot of events and such, but the problem I'm coming across is, and you can't really call out these interviewers and, and people like that because they'll interview you and they'll pretend like, oh yeah, you know, you have great qualifications, you have great this and that, the other thing. And then you find out that the person that did get the job is not only underqualified, but you know, a whole bunch of other things. Obviously you can't point it out. So my question to you is, is there anywhere that I can go that is, um, a group or some sort of an internal, any companies or anywhere that 
would look at, for example, perfect example, I'm a, I'm a traditional knock engineer, which I'm finding out the hard way that in today's society as a network engineer, you're going to need that programming and scripting and sysadmin type of experience, which I love learning. I definitely want to learn, for example, Python. You go to, I've been to so many different interviews where they want you on as a network engineer and they expect that hands-on Python experience. Well, if nobody's going to hire me, I'm not going to get the hands-on experience. Is there any companies out there that you guys can maybe suggest that has any programs geared towards women so you can actually not have these walls and, and this, you know, gear going in, going, okay, everybody, every day is going to be a battle, you know? Is there any programs that will bring you in and help you get the hands-on experience that these companies are requiring? Mm. So that is a difficult question. I don't want to answer again if I'm not supposed to. Uh, so one site that I can forward you to is 2050. It's uh, founded by my friend Kat Gabriel, and it's a job platform for people of color. And what it does is it identifies companies that are looking to hire more diverse voices. And so if you have technical skills, there's software engineer jobs that are posted there. And you know, one, you found an ally in a company that is acknowledging and is aware of the fact that there is such you know, a disperse or a small amount of people of color in their companies. And they're saying, hey, we want to let you know that we see you and we're trying to see you, right? So come volunteer here. The other thing I could just talk about is my program that specifically makes an effort to find women of color that may be interested in getting into tech and partnering you up with a community full of professional de designers and developers that can kind of help to promote you in your career, so. Um. I don't have any companies to recommend, I'm so sorry, but uh, one thing I, I wanted to highlight is I was recently re reading about, I think it's Etsy, who like, instead of having this traditional interview process, which I think is absolute, like, I hate the engineering interview process, I never want to apply for a job ever <laughs> again, because it's just like, that's not what real work is like. And I think that Etsy and someone in the room can correct me if I'm wrong, had this thing where instead of you just going in and being like, like grilled, you actually go in for like two weeks and co-work on projects with people. Um, and I hope, I don't, maybe they pay you, they should pay you for that time because that's a lot of time that you're spending there. Um, but I think that that's like a really encouraging model of like really seeing how you work with people and how you like, even if you don't have the exact information right there, like how you find the right information. So I'd encourage any like hiring managers in the room to kind of think about exploring that because I think that's definitely you know that's the way we work we don't work like we're taking computer science exams we work like we're talking with people um, and googling things and like drawing on this rich knowledge to solve complex problems so if you could find a company that has that kind of interview process I think that would work really well for you and I also just wanted to like do a quick side note of you mentioned that like people think that you are in the note taker in the room. And I saw a lot of people like, like nodding their heads of like, this happens to me all the time. Um, one tip that I really wanted to share that's been working really well on, on my team at work, um, we're about, we're, we're split 50, 50 between women and men. Um, and, uh, we established a note taker rotation for our team meetings. Cause we saw that it was always, uh, women like just kind of volunteering to, to do that sort of like office house work of, of, um, taking the notes. So we now have a note taker rotation and we like consult this spreadsheet every time we have a team meeting and it's like an extra layer of process, but it really, really helps with like distributing those sorts of roles that often fall on, on women and other minorities to kind of do all the maintenance work for the team. So yeah, the, the I'm like, for example, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago and they didn't bother, the team didn't bother asking me that this was a new team. They didn't bother asking me, hey, introduce yourself, this and that. And when there was an important thing that somebody was mentioning, I mean, literally all the heads turned to me. Did you get that down? I said, no, did you guys? Yeah. <laughs> That's the perfect and, response. Right? And they looked, they're like, oh, well, aren't you supposed to be here taking notes? I said, no less than anybody else here. I said, I'm, oh, you're not Mr. Zakria. I said, no. I'm Ms. Zikria, and I'm here to do what you're doing. So, I mean, that's just one of the examples, you know, so. Yeah. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Yeah, a lot of work to do there. Thanks. All right.
I'm, I'm so sorry, we're over time, but so we're all gonna be at lunch if there are questions that folks have. I'm so sorry not to get to everyone and appreciate. I wanna thank you um, so, so, so much, all the panelists for sharing so openly and vulnerably about your amazing experiences. Everyone can join me in thanking them.